Which tools should I buy when I'm first starting metalsmithing and jewelry making? This question can be overwhelming. I'd like to make your life less complicated and help you with these decisions. I'm Greg Greenwood and welcome to my studio. First, you don't need a huge pile of tools. I'll show you the must-have tools to get you started, plus some that are nice to have. Safety is a priority. Make sure that you have good eye protection and a good mask. N95s are perfect for jewelry making. They keep the compound dust out of your lungs. A good solid workbench is essential in jewelry making. It doesn't have to be large. You can customize it to fit your studio and your needs. Just as long as it's nice and solid. Super important. A bench pin is important also for working on and for sawing. This is one that's off the bench. This is one with a C-clamp that will attach to the top of your bench. They have those in different styles. You should get a bench vise. This is a small bench vise that will hold your mandrels for you. It doesn't have to be a small bench vise. You can use a large one if you wish. But this is a small one, works real handy for working on the bench. Notice these. These are lubricants for sawing, and we'll talk about those later. Forging and hammering on a steel surface is an everyday occurrence in jewelry making. This is the whole gamut here. This is the must-have tool in your studio is a bench block. Inexpensive, an anvil is awesome, but they can be expensive. You can go ahead and make your own anvil using a railroad track. This is one that I've polished up, works really nice. Or you can use any other pieces of metal that you can find to hammer on. A T-stake is a tool that you'll be getting in the future. But for right now, this is the must-have, the bench block. Inexpensive, and you'll be using it almost every day. Pliers and cutters are the workhorse of the jewelry studio. A chain nose plier is a must-have. They come to a nice point. They have a box hinge, which will hold them nice and secure together. A flat nose plier is also a must-have nice flat jaws, and then a nice flat end to the pliers. Great plier. A round nose plier is also a must-have for bending wires in nice circles and for bending sheet metal. A plier that's not a must-have but is really nice is the ring bending plier. It has nylon jaws. You can use this for bending wires and sheet metal. This one has got nylon jaws on it. It will not mark your metal also. Nice to have, but not a must have. The parallel pliers are really, I feel, a must have. They are great for holding metal and they'll hold your metal evenly, unlike the chain nose and the flat nose pliers. A fun parallel plier here is the duck bill parallel plier. It has a screw on it so it can adjust the width of the plier. Uh, I like these for fold forming. They're really great. Not a must have, you can get those later. A must have is definitely the ultra flush cutter. They'll cut your wires nice and smooth on the one side and I feel that they are a must have. Don't bother with any other kind of cutter except for an ultra flush cutter. Sawing sheet metal in the studio is a skill that you'll be learning and the tool that is a must-have is a jeweler's saw frame. This is a German saw frame, real basic, straightforward frame. It's adjustable and it is about four and a half inches deep and this is a great tool to use. I've used this one for over 40 years, my favorite saw frame. There are many, many other saw frames that are on the market. 
that are very good saw frames. They work really well, but they can be expensive. So I would stick with the basic German jeweler saw frame. You'll be happy and you'll use it for many years. You'll be using saw blades. Aught zero to two numbers are good and I would use a German or Swiss blade. Remember this over on the bench when we were looking at the bench pin? This is Burr Life. This is a lubrication for your saw blades. You can use an old candle or many jewelers use beeswax also. Lubes are a must for your saw blades. Aviation snips are handy uh, for cutting basic metal and a nice good lightweight metal shear is great for cutting the basics here and the must-haves are the German saw frame, the blades and the lubes. Hand files are a must in the jewelry studio. This flat file has a safety edge on it and I would look for the safety edges. The other edge will have teeth on it. It's great with that safety edge. You can get up to other pieces without filing them. A half round is also a must have. It has a flat surface and a half round on the other side. A ring file is a, like a half round, only smaller than the half round. A barrette or a beret file has got a flat surface with the teeth and then the sides and the back are all safety edges. Great file to use. All these are must-haves. Half round needle files are awesome. They can get into small areas and a round rat tail needle file is great. You can buy a set of needle files. That would be great. To clean any of the files I like to use a brass brush and I use a brass stick to get the metal out of the teeth. Also, a card file is a good tool to have. Your emery sticks are great. You'll be making these, and I have a video showing these. You can check that out also. There are hundreds of styles and sizes of hammers in the metalsmithing industry. These are some that I'd like you to consider. This one is a cross-peen forging hammer. It has a cross-peen and a flat peen. This is a rather large forging hammer, and then this goes all the way down to a real small one with a cross peen. There are sizes from the small to the large. Choose one that will fit the size of the work that you'll be working on. This is a raising hammer or a forming hammer. Again, large down to very small. You can choose a size that will fit for the type of work that you'll be working on. A must-have is the planishing hammer. This has two different peens on it, one that's slightly domed here, and then a flat peen. This is so you can work on curved metal or flat metal. The chasing hammer has a big broad peen on it, and this is used for hammering on center punches, chasing tools, and repose tools. A rawhide mallet is a great tool to use for forming metal without marking the metal. You can use a plastic or a nylon mallet also. So these are the ones that are must-haves from your raising and forming hammers to the cross peen to the planishing hammer, chasing hammer, rawhide mallet and or plastic or nylon mallet. Mandrels are real important in jewelry making, especially this one right here, a ring mandrel. This one has the sizes marked on the mandrel. I would suggest getting one of these. This is a must have. The bracelet mandrel is not as essential right now. You can get that later. You can get some smaller tapered mandrels and this is an oval bezel mandrel. If you're going to be setting a lot of oval bezel sets, I would get one of these. Also, these punches are of various sizes for making jump rings, but you can 
avoid buying those by getting a drill bit set. You can use that for making jump rings. A nice little trick for holding your ring mandrel is to drill a hole into the front of your bench. Then you can take the ring mandrel, slide it into the hole, and it makes it really nice and firm for working on the ring mandrel. You can hammer on it. It's really nice and solid in this way. Some miscellaneous tools that you may consider, and I think are must-haves, are a ruler, some dividers for marking your metal, a center punch. This is an automatic center punch, a little more expensive. A scribe. A triangular scraper. You can make your own out of a triangular file or buy one. A burnisher. Ring sizer. And a ring clamp. All must-haves that are really very useful for jewelry making. A designated soldering area, either in a corner of your workbench or a separate area, is crucial for setting up an efficient and safe studio. Start with a non-combustible work surface to protect your workbench, like a vermiculite soldering pad or fire bricks. A torch is a must and there are plenty to choose from. Ones with large tanks with acetylene and oxygen to very small using butane gas. Check with your local insurance carrier and local regulations to see if you have any restrictions. Here's a propane plumber's torch. The good things about this torch is that one, it's inexpensive and it's easily accessible at any hardware store. The bad part is that it does have limitations on the tips and it's hard to control the size of the tips and maybe be a little bit more accurate as you're soldering. Here are a couple examples of butane torches. Butane torches are real popular in jewelry making at this time because they're so convenient. They're fairly easy to get a hold of. The one on the right uh, I just bought at a, uh, a hardware store and the one on the left I did get from a, a jewelry supply house. They come in different sizes. The one on the right has got a real small tip on it and it's limited for the size of pieces that I can solder. The one on the left is a little bit larger so I can solder larger pieces with that. They're real easy to refill. The handle has a little uh, area where you can store butane gas and you can buy cans of butane gas at hardware stores or even box stores in the camping area. This is the torch that I've used for many years. This is a Prestolite acetylene air mixture torch. It has a tank of acetylene gas underneath the bench, which has a gauge on it and a hose that comes up and attaches to the torch itself. It has a little knob there to turn on the gas and turn it off. And the air is actually mixed into the torch up at that little nut that's at the top of the handle and just below the tip. That's where the air and the gas mix. And then you get a real nice hot flame at the end of the torch. It comes with different tips. And so I can solder from real small pieces all the way up to huge pieces of annealing and even for melting silver for casting. Many torches don't have automatic starters, like my Prestolite does not have one, and so I use an automatic sparker to start the torch. This is a little black box that has batteries in it and a little spark plug-like deal in the middle. You simply take the torch, turn on the gas, and then push down on one of the little buttons that are around it, and it'll produce a spark and it will light your torch. The flint and steel striker that's right next to it, uh, this can be a little bit um, uh, cumbersome as you're lighting your torch, but a real standard for many, many years. Now that we've talked about protecting your bench from heat and the type of torches to use, Let's take a look at more of the must-haves. The first thing is some type of a soldering block. This is a hard charcoal soldering block. I like to use that because it doesn't fall apart as easily as the soft charcoal. Then below that is a ceramic perforated soldering block. It has little holes in it so I can stick pins down in it and hold the pieces in position as I'm soldering them. 
The next thing is the third hand. It has a weighted base with a universal joint on it and the cross lock tweezers are attached to the top. This way you can position them in any position for soldering your pieces. The next is the cross lock tweezers and these have some little wooden handles on them. Makes it a little bit more comfortable as you're using them around the torch so you don't burn your fingers. The next is a titanium pick and this is great for pushing your pallions of solder into a position as you're soldering and also a lot of people use them to pick up the pieces of solder to put in position as they're being soldered. The next thing is solder shears. Try to get a good pair of solder shears. The cheaper ones just don't last very long. You should have a couple of tweezers. You do not have to get the super expensive tweezers. These are relatively cheap tweezers that you can use for picking up your pallions of solder and for pushing them in position and using them to move your pieces as you're soldering. I like to use the sheet silver for soldering uh, so I can cut little pallions. I don't use wire solder very much at all. So uh, you'll be getting the different grades, easy, medium, and hard. Those are your three basic grades. Then you'll need some type of a borax flux. I like to use the borax flux and I like to use handy flux. Um, this is already prepared for me. All I have to do is just take my brush put her down in there and use it. If it starts getting a little bit hard, just add a little water to it, mix it up and it works really well. A must have for soldering is an acid solution for removing oxides called pickle. There are many different commercial brands. One is Sparex. Citric acid is a good safe acid to use. Pick it up in the canning section of your grocery store. The pickle works best when it is warm. Get a crock pot with a lid from a resale shop. They're really cheap and they work great. Ventilation for your soldering area is a must have. I'll be doing a separate video on ventilation in your studio soon. Watch for it. The flexible shaft in my opinion is a must have for every jewelry studio. It can do a wide variety of tasks for you and make your job so much easier. You may be tempted to get a Dremel type tool to do the job because it will be cheaper than the flexible shaft. But in my opinion, in the long term, the flexible shaft is much more versatile and will do a much better job for you. This is the Fordham SR model flexible shaft. It has a forward and reverse on it, which is kind of nice for if people are polishing that are left-handed, you can use that. It comes in handy. At the end of the shaft, you can put different hand pieces. This is the H30 standard hand piece. It has a chuck that is a variable size and you need to use a chuck key for it to tighten it on down. But it's very flexible because you can use it for different drills and different tools. One of my favorites is the H20 quick change hand piece. You have a little lever that you flip out opens up the chuck and then you can tighten it on down onto your pieces. You can get various size of little buffs uh, from muslin, hard felt, a little brush. Silicone ones are really nice. These are the 3M polishing wheels, but they can be very expensive. You'll be using different compounds. The I like white diamond and the red rouge is standard for buffing. This is really a neat tool that I sh should recommend to you. It's a split shaft. You take your emery paper and you slide it into the little slot on the shaft and then you can spin it and you can get inside rings to take emery to them really, really versatile little tool. Different burrs, you can get a round burr or a rosebud burr 
are really nice. They're not essential right at first, but you do need a set of drill bits. Now these drill bits, as you'll notice, are fairly small, but they do have a shank on them. That's the 332nd, which will match up to your quick change um, H20 handpiece. A must have for the jewelry studio, a flexible shaft. I hope this video has helped you decide which tools are must haves for your studio. If you have any questions, please comment below and I'll get back to you. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell. I'm Greg Greenwood and I'll see you next time.